Are you guys ready? I got a lot of a lot of Russian ammo right here. Perfect. Oh, just thirty-nine. Yeah, this is gold. Red? This is my investment right here. This is my retirement account. It says it's the red. It That's your retirement eight. account. <laughs> hey, you can probably re you can probably retire on that box right now. Yeah. Red Army Standard. That sounds pretty legit. All right, guys. Welcome to Practical Shooting After Dark. Um, we're here to talk about shooting. You guys know the deal. Everybody comes here with a topic, something fun to talk about. Um, on deck today, Mr. Joel Park. Hello. Mr. Kim. Hello. Mr. Andreas. Hello. Oh, man. Andreas' is audio is so nice, so clean. It's excellent. Well, like I said, you guys know the deal. Who wants to go first with their topic? Or do you guys want to go with the one I just sent you now that it's fresh in your minds? Ben, I think you have a good one to... Uh... It's a good one to start on. It is a good one to start on. All right, so I got an email from a, a, a listener, a guy that I know a little bit. He's sent me some pretty reliable stuff in the past, and I'm gonna I'm gonna tell a story without telling the story right now in order to not dox anyone involved. Um, but uh, anyway, he sent me an email after I'm not gonna name the match, and now this has been we've we've been some time from this match, so. I don't think uh, if you don't know, you're not going to be able to figure out figure it out from anything we're saying, and that's that's a good thing. But after um, whatever match last week, I noticed a significant sorry, scoring issue while reviewing some footage, significant enough to af apply affect first and second place in this division. He brought the attention of the MD and the shooters involved. As expected, there's nothing they can do about it. I mean, this is a week after the fact. I think this was an honest mistake. I believe the RO read the timer off incorrectly. Um, uh, you can hear the RO call the times out in the original clip. I've attached clips that demonstrate a more accurate time. And what he attached here was um, essentially the supporting uh, information, like the scores that were scored in the match, the footage of, of people shooting it, and the, the timing software. And it looks fairly incontrovertible. There was a scoring error at this match that swapped uh, swapped winners for that division. Uh, okay, based on these clips, it's clear and easy call to make. This is his email now. Um, this other guy's the winner. Currently, we have no mecha mechanisms in place to fix this kind of error, even with sufficient evidence. Now, remember, now it's a week after the fact. For some reason, people insist that video cannot be used as evidence. I call bull. Paul Hendricks was caught based on video evidence. I have two questions for your group to discuss. Number one, should scoring corrections extend past the normal arbitration period, especially when they affect the winner of a major match? In the world of sports, it's not uncommon for athletes to have titles taken away for cheating. In this case, it would be reasonable to make an adjustment even after the arbitration period. Number two, should video evidence be allowed? It can be incorporated like this. Video, video evidence is allowed at the discretion of the RM or MD, says this guy. As someone who shot this match and in the same division as these as the other guys i feel cheated out of an accurate match score i think this issue is bigger and more important than the recent issues of practice score cheaters i say that because there will always be human error involved when scoring a match we need ways to mitigate these errors so we can have accurate results all right so that's that's the email on it uh why don't we go around and get a hot take from everybody if you have a hot take on this uh, Andreas, you wanted to say something before we before we key it up. I don't know what you're going to say. I'm curious though. I've seen like with uh, after the fact, we've had people who have um, like technologies come along with blood tests, blood tests, and people have had titles stripped or wins removed. But I've never seen, or I don't recall, scoring mistakes ever going back and changing the results of a sporting event it's kind of like once it's in the books it's in the books unless there's something extremely drastic like somebody was doping or whatnot but i think the the person writing in has a good point that the, this should be written down like that could be a reasonable addition to the rule book on like once the score is closed once the trophies are handed out what's still on the table because you yeah. can't have people coming out of the woodwork a week later or six weeks later or a year later, and they have video evidence that, that changes the results. I mean, you can't have yeah. basically every match result being tentative because yeah, something there, may there, come out. There has to be an end to it at some point. Yeah. Right? So I would say short of something drastic, like 
the person didn't really shoot the match or somebody ad- admits that they were paid to change the scores, maybe something really drastic. I, I think you got to just let it ride and it kind of sucks, but that's, that's the way it is. That, so. That's in the interest of the sport and just having a, you've declared the winner and then you move on. Yeah. Mr. Kim, you got a hot take on this? Yes. Uh, before we, I, uh, before I, talk about my opinion the first thing that really shocked me when i started the sport i mean sometimes uh, still things a lot of things shock me still but the first thing ever shocked me was the first nationals i went to uh there was an incident where an RO was too far away from the shooter and the last shot didn't pick up on multiple people and people immediately noticed the score was wrong multiple people were having unreasonable time so all of them were offered to reshoot, but not all of them accepted that offer. That shouldn't be an offer. It should be mandatory to mandatory reshoot. That's kind of like a, I guess, range equipment failure, so to say. Yeah. Like a timer failure should be part of something like that. So that was the first thing shocked. And that. That's not happens. even in the rule book, if I remember. Like it's like a, a reshoot's mandatory. It should be, but at yeah. nationals. Yeah, they don't always follow the rule book at nationals, Mr. Andreas. I learned this to my very first nationals as well. Same as Mr. Kim. What's well, the USPSA guidelines? <laughs> yeah, the attitudes have changed a lot since I started. Like they made an attempt to follow the rule book back, back like now I don't I don't think they really give a shit anymore. Which is and, just a change in attitude. Uh as far as I know at nationals, there's like a uh, staff that cares about the scorings and stuff. And I think um, some staffs should pay more attention or maybe designated staff to do like scoring, checking stuff like that. I think it has to be there. And about the real question, number one, about a weak uh, arbitrarily, I am on the same page with Andreas. Yeah. But I just think there's got to be more work to within that short arbitration phase, what is it, four hours, something like that? And actually to filter those. Yeah. And Mr. Joel, what's your hot take on this? Um, I agree a lot with what Andreas said. It's not like, hey, Ben, you want to know that national title you won in 2015? Well, some new some new informations came to light. You know what I mean? Like, you couldn't, you can't do new that. New shit has come to light, Obviously. man. <laughs> you, <laughs> well, that's like your opinion, man. Uh, <laughs> unchecked aggression. Uh, but I remember, I don't like dropping names, but the Paul Hendricks situation for a while, and I don't know if it's like for part of the country or whatever, but around me for a while, there was like a habit where the RO would always like show you the timer after your last shot. Like you looked at the physical timer and then they entered the, like as they repeated to the scorekeeper. And I don't know if that was maybe just around my area or not, but that was for a while, like a big thing. And then I, I kind of think like, well, it is partially you it's partially on the range officials because obviously they need to be recording things accurately, but it's also partially the competitor's responsibility. Because if I'm walking through and I, you know, like before I hit okay on the tablet, I'm like, what? It says I have I didn't have any deltas. I'm like, oh no, no, that, that was that was supposed to be a Charlie. And there was like there could have been some honest little mistake. So I do think part of it is the competitor is required to verify their score before they accept it in the tablet. So yeah. I kind of see both sides of the argument. Well, I uh, don't place a lot of uh, responsibility on the competitors, quite honestly, but that's just me. I think that's what range. I think that's what the match staff says when they fuck something up. I understand. That's that's typically how I see that line used. It's like the match staff fucked up. Oh well, you're supposed to verify your score. Like I've been the guy refusing to hit verify on the tablet because my score was fucked up, and the range like and have the range master come over and like and like he tells me I have to arbitrate, and I'm like, what? That didn't even make sense. That was actually a pretty funny situation, but not directly related to this. Uh, okay, so looking at this, obviously we all agree this is a heartbreaking situation. This is bullshit. This should not happen. It's inevitable that it will happen occasionally, I think, but it should not happen and we should hate this, right? 
Yes. Especially, to, uh, it's okay to say it's an area match, so it's a it's a really big yeah, deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. Yeah, it's a big fucking deal. It's not just a club. I mean, it, it wouldn't be a club match. I don't care if it's a club. This is a big anger deal. Is, anger is justified. Anger you and butthurt are justified here. This, this yes. would make people angry. This would make me angry to be on either side of this. Yes. Like, um, I'm not surprised that this happened. I would predict you were going to see more of this stuff in coming years and not less. I would say uh, officiating has loosened up a lot in the last few years, and I expect that trend to uh, likely continue. And that would uh, that that would be what if I have to lay this at at like point to the problem and like lay this at someone's feet, I'd say that's the problem. Officiating has loosened up quite a bit. Um, yes. All right, but that's just that's just my read on it. So let's let's get to the specific questions. Should scoring corrections extend past the normal arbitration period, especially when they affect the winner of a major match? In the world of sports, it's not uncommon for athletes to have titles take away for cheating. Okay, so we have a one-hour arbitration period, which I should also say at most major matches it's typically waved. is not observed. They're like, Correct. we're waiving arbitration. I'm like, I don't know how that works, but all right, we're waiving. So typically that's that's not even a thing. It's waived. Um should it should it be longer? Should it be shorter? Should it be if if there's a a piece of information that affects the winner of the match? Should the should the period of time be longer? What do you think, guys? Like being serious, like we have we we all agree you got to cut it off somewhere and be like, yeah, we're done with this. This match is done. But when should that be? I mean, that when the when the scores are, or when the awards are handed out. Okay, but we could make that it like like we're just speaking in the realm of theory, right? Yeah. So we could say, okay, it'll be like we're gonna hand out the, we'll we'll mail out the awards a week after the match. Which I'm not sure I like this idea, but let's just let's go with it. What do you, you Joel's shaking his head? I wouldn't nope. want to go home not knowing if I've actually yeah. won something or not. That would be for us. I totally agree. I but wouldn't if, like that. If I put myself in both people's shoes of this situation, if I won a match that I wasn't entitled to, I would probably say something publicly and I would definitely, like, I would feel very bad about that. Oh, you're uh, like, you're in a bad spot in either one of these. The guy who, the guy with a title he d doesn't feel he deserved is like, it's kind of like, this is your moment to come out and I, say something in public. And, and the other guy has to keep his fucking mouth shut and he's going to look like a bitch. And yes, if I was a second place guy, internally, I would probably be some form of irate, but absolutely yeah. would not say anything publicly because it's a terrible look. So yeah, both both shoes do. are terrible spots to be in. Yeah. Uh, I understand why they waive the arbitration normally because, I mean, hey, it's hot. It's probably a Sunday afternoon. If they don't get no, to tearing I mean, down. Why are we talking them. about this? They always waive it. Like, yes. What are you talking about? It's always waived. Is it not? Unless it was required for you not to waive it. Like, there's no more yeah. waiving the ARB period. I guess it was what was the forming the question I was going to form. Yeah, Do you I think mean, that well, should be a thing. Well, the, the majors I've been to, everybody, when they've had the ARB period, they're just, everybody's kind of standing around very awkwardly. Like, can we just yes. wave this shit and move on? Yes. Uh, yes. They're, I mean, they always wave it. All right. So that's okay. That. I, I don't think you're going to get around the fact that you have to stop. Like you have to be like, no, we're done with this shit. At a certain point, you just got to call it. All right. Number question two, should video evidence be allowed? It can be incorpor incorporated like this. Video evidence is allowed at the discretion of the RMMD. Like I, I'll speak for myself here. Video evidence should absolutely be allowed. Uh, allowing it in that way at the discretion of the RM. Fuck that. That's idiotic. I will say that that's stupid. Like the whole point of video evidence is to take that to someone that doesn't want to look at it. That would be a hard headed RM who does not want to see what you are showing them. And the rules should compel them to look at it and take action. If you're going to allow it, you have to allow it. And the whole point is it would force them to look at it, not at their discretion. Fuck that. Anyway, you guys have a different take. No, I think, well, I, I absolutely think video evidence should be allowed, but depends on what situation. So, for yes. example, uh, I personally had second nationals I shot. I had a foot fault, but all the squad mates were telling the RO it wasn't a foot fault. And there was three, two or three cameras rolling, videoing me. And then they were actually going frame by frame, and they saw the slide wrecked 
before the foot hit the ground. But in that case, depends on the video angle, it may look not foot fault at all. But in, in perspective on the range as an RO, it may look like a foot fault. So in this kind of case, or like 180, if it's past 181, 182, something like that, something very ambiguous, that it's very difficult to tell through the video, I think it shouldn't be allowed. Like, to I be think honest, that's the best time to use a video. Like 181 yeah. or 179 through the video, it's almost impossible to tell, it depends on the video angle, unless there was like a mark to the show 180 line, then uh -huh. maybe a little bit. I, you know what? How, I, how, I, I disagree how, with you. I think how, if I think if you show me video of an ambiguous 180 call and the guy yeah. got DQ'd, that guy's back in the match now. Mm -hmm. Like the rule for me, like me personally, if I, I will watch a video once at full speed, if I'm not sure if it's a DQ or not, it's not a DQ. I agree with that one. Like, like, are you like, go fuck yourself. You're going to frame by frame this thing. Like that's, that's so stupid. How many also, times the excuse I hear all the time is that the video you have an ambiguous angle or whatnot, but like how is the ambiguous angle of the video any different than the ambiguous angle of the RO? Uh, it's different in that it was recorded and like now it's like it's ambiguous but irrefutable, and a yeah. lot of ROs don't like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, oh, of course, of course. <laughs> But yeah, like using video to overturn scoring calls and overturn DQs, like I like that idea. I don't know why we aren't doing that. Like I if agree. it's an like why why do we want ambiguous DQs? Like these are safety rules. If it's ambiguous, why are we punishing people? It, it adds time. <laughs> yeah. It impedes match flow. It just like, that, that is that, that is like, the boot that fucker out of there. It, it that is the problem. Because then everybody would be recording every run, and they're yes. worried it would. I'm not. I'm just speculation. They'd be worried about slowing down the match. That you're not really speculating much there, Joel. Well, I would bet a lot of money on that. Yeah, that would be my best guess. Yeah, I, I def, I definitely like. I mean, it, it's, it, it's at the point where, like me, if, if speaking for myself, if I'm range master or whatever at, at something like, and, and we have it wrong. Like, we don't have the facts, we made the wrong call, and somebody is in possession of a video that's going to give us the right call. Like, I would want to see that. Yes. That, yeah. Especially when, like, you know the next day that shit's going on Facebook anyway, and you're going to look like a jackass. Like, I, I don't know why RMs are not beating, like, beating down yeah. USPSA's doors. Like, no, let us look at the video. This situation's, in, like, this is... This crazy, is intolerable. Yeah. It's cra it is, it's crazy at this point when hell lately, every time somebody gets whacked in one of these riots, I get to watch the video on Twitter like an hour later. Mm -hmm. And you're telling me like we like we have cameras everywhere now. Mm. And we can't like the, the people making calls can't look at video. It's uh, are are you kidding me? Well, like I'm not a big football fan, uh, but even if you like watch sports, whatever where they like stop the game where they can do video review. Like other sports do that also because they want to make sure they get an accurate call that is correct. Yes. We so if they're like, correctly. if it's a football game, like it happens so fast, like I don't really know what I just saw. I need, hold on. I need to check the video yeah, because yeah. I, I don't want to tell you the wrong thing or make an indirect or a wrong call that may sway the game one way or the other. I would, yeah. I would actually love to see a rule change. Look, you know how fixed time five seconds, 5.3 seconds is still. <laughs> a shot, no penalty, right? So for 180, we set the 180 rule, but for a DQ, I think, yeah, like 185 degree or something like that, then using the video can definitely help them to uh, avoid the argument with the RO and the shooter. If the rule allows 180, but DQ is actually like, what, 185, something like that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just, yeah, just like the five second fixed time rule. Or yeah, if you I mean, have an RO say like, hey, you're pretty close to breaking 180. That probably means like more than likely you probably broke 180, but I'm not really positive. So be careful. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. A, that's about right. All right. Let's uh, let's move on. Uh, Joel, what do you have for us tonight? Let's talk about uh, some fun, spicy stuff. Nothing fun and spicy. Mine's a show and nope. tell, I suppose. Uh, but I'm too lazy to go get it. So it's out in the garage. Um, 
I used to look at people pulling their little range carts and thought like, man, those guys are going to wear themselves out by pulling that cart everywhere and look at all that crap they bring with them and stuff. And now at my old age, I've decided it's probably not such a bad idea. <laughs> um, you know, like thanks to Hopkins and, you know, other people, like I bring a fan now and you know, I've got a cooler because you need to have drinks and, you know, if you have a folding chair, or snacks, your range bag, ammo, all that crap. So um, I actually like the idea of having one of the little range wagons or carts. Um, and I think it's smart to use it, but only in specific occasions. So for instance, if you're at a match where it's super hilly and you're going to be going like up and down hills and it just like you're not going to be passing by your car well, or you're going to be in like close range to your car, there's probably no reason to be having it. If you're going to go up and down a lot of hills or like somewhere that you don't even want to walk, dragging this wagon is going to be a dumb idea. But if you have a fairly flat range, you're going to be out there in the sun, you're away from your car, having a wagon loaded up with like all the stuff that you might possibly need. I don't think it's such a bad idea. Can I, can I present an alternate approach? Yes. <laughs> so I, I, I stole this from uh, Sal Luna yeah. that I used to carry a lot of stuff at matches and then mm -hmm. shooting with Sal, he had a box with some ammo in it and his lunch. And then he had a jug of water. And I just kind of looked at what I had. I'm like, I am bringing way too much shit to this bay that I don't need. So I just left it all in the car. Oh, no, you should just look at it and be like, oh, he's a minimalist. <laughs> <laughs> I was more like looking at him like this man is brilliant and I need to just not carry as much stuff. So I'll suggest that as an alternate. It's like kind of look at what you're carrying around the match and like maybe three quarters of it you don't actually need. I would agree with that. Even like a backup gun. Like if I need to switch guns, I can go to my car to get yeah, that. Yeah, that's that's a rare enough thing that I go to the car. I agree with you. Uh, but no, there's some occasions where I actually really like it. Or uh, I shoot some two-gun matches locally. And by the time yeah, I'm carrying you a start need that. Yeah. yeah, a carbine also and a set of mags for that and two types of ammo and stuff. Yeah. So anyway, on some occasions, I like it a lot and I'm quite glad I have it. I wouldn't use it all the time, but I've kind of changed my mind from thinking that's so dumb. Why would you have so much garbage to like, oh, Sometimes it's kind of handy, and uh, otherwise, some of my uh, I think you've my... just gotten old. That's probably true, also. Uh, I was spoiled, I'd have some of my friends locally would just let me put my stuff in their carts and they would pull it for me. That is best case, but well, that, that happens when you hit GM. <laughs> they did that to make a show, actually. Yes, <laughs> like, oh no, here, sir, let me carry a range bag for you. Yes, like, yes, I hate you so much right now, yeah. But anyway, having one at times is kind of handy. So it's just another thing I throw in my car. When I get to the match, if I want it, I'll use it. And if not, it might stay in my trunk. Yeah. What do you got, Kim? My turn? Yeah. Yes. So uh, I just want to share some stuff I've been working on. Uh, the ammo shortage, uh, primer shortage is real. So a lot of people having... Do you actually yes. need... Do you truly need primers? So I have you personally primers. need them? I have 7,000 primers, and I'm uh, shooting less amount. So, but bro, my I, I can are, get you primers. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna search you out. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, we'll like, have a conversation before the after end of the this. night. We'll talk later. Yes. The, so the big problem is I have a ammo sponsor, but the the shipment issue due to COVID is delaying everything. So for me, I've been spending way less mon uh, ammo. I used to shoot 700, like at least. 700 rounds per session, but now I'm going more towards two to 300 rounds per session. So my the drill setup, everything drastically changed due to shortage. So I, what I've been focusing is the reaction time. So in that case, I'm shooting a lot of one-shot drills. So when I say reaction time, there's a couple reactions. So auditorial reaction, which is like a buzzer drill. You hear the buzzer and you tap it as fast as possible. I used to shoot first shot uh, for the buzzer. So you can't actually shoot as soon as you hear the buzzer, but it requires ammo. So I started tapping the buzzer to conserve ammo. So I, I do that and I try to keep that reaction time 15th of a second to 20, somewhere in the that window. And another one is visual reaction. So for that, what I'm doing is I, I'm shooting tough enough shot that I need to make sure the recoil goes straight up and keep the gun steady. I'm not trying to transition off 
early or something like that. So as soon as I see that lift lifting off of the red dot, I initiate the movement. It could be a visual movement after the response. So what I mean by that is as soon as I see the dot lifting up, my vision goes to the next target as soon as possible. And if it's a physical reaction, then I would move to another position, uh, initiating my movement as soon as I see the jump of the dot. So when I first started visual reaction stuff, so I would typically do 20 yard mini popper or 15 yard headshot, something like that. Uh, visually before what I saw is I would see the whole arc of recoil going all the way up and then moving out. And then after trying to really respond visually fast and fast, now I'm seeing is like a half of the recoil and already my vision's off the target. So that's something I do. And physical response is basically on a hoser target. I am forcing myself to exit the target visually or moving out of the position as soon as I feel the trigger pull all the way. So in that case, I am actually doing walkthrough. Uh, I have my arms up on the target, actually pull my finger, even without a gun, I will pull my finger. On the second pull, I initiate the movement rather than trying to see then response. In that case, I am definitely not responding to what I see, which takes more time, usually yeah. a tenth of a second. But if I am actually exiting at the same time as the finger curls all the way, I'm not necessarily responding to feel or responding to vision. It's almost programmed to do certain thing at, at a certain physical uh, positioning, basically. So I did a lot of one shots on each target. So like I said, a tougher shot on the 20 yard, or a close shot, finger all the way, one shot, and then do immediately, and then enter next position, and then shoot one shot. So a lot of the runs require two shot per run. So actually, I, I had a lot of fun actually doing that. The focus is a little bit different than shooting a multiple skill testing courses. Like it could be go stop or designated target where you're doing multiple things a lot at the same time, but I'm just trying to separate only the reaction time each time, just one shot each time, and I'm trying to respond as fast as possible. What that developed for me was uh, the mind set is a little bit different. When I try to respond super fast, it's almost like I'm having a tinger on my sensation. I'm firing that nerve fast as possible, as fast as possible. But when I try to go like all alpha mode, sometimes I may not have that or shooting comfortable pace. I may not have those tingles or trying to respond as fast as possible. In that case, it's more of an observation feel than mm -hmm. trying to like respond super fast. So that that's been pretty interesting. Uh, Kim, well, you're, I mean, 700 rounds is more than I shoot in a practice session, even I mean, ammo, I can shoot as much ammo as I want. I don't, I'm not going to stick around for 700 rounds. Do you think your practice sessions will be shorter? Have you, do you think going forward, even when ammo is not an issue, they'll be shorter? Or do you think you'll go back to the 700 rounds? Uh, first, my sessions are almost always an hour and a half, whether I'm shooting oh, okay. 700 That's or interesting. two, 300. Let's go, man. You are yeah. okay. Yes, because I, I go high cap or high round count. Uh, drills like designated target you're just one drills over you're almost done 30 40 rounds so but right uh, now one run requires two rounds man I, over here i'm dealing with a primer surplus it's a little different for you though <laughs> yeah i'm running out of room to store yeah. everything but <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite with, with, <laughs> with, with designated target i've been shooting one per target because it's, it's fundamentally a transition drill. So I've been shooting one per target just to verify the transition as opposed to, to doing it two per. And I feel like I still get a lot out of it. Yeah. Eventually you want to shoot two, two. Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. More, complicate more of it. Gotcha. Yeah. Do you feel like your practices are different or more or less productive or, or differently productive? Oh, it's very equally productive, I would say. Just different. I'm working on different areas. Uh, yeah. Reaction one is more specific. And my previous 
high round count ones are more complicated ones that I'm combining things. Yep. Do you uh, are you doing any more dry training on the range now? Um, dry training. I would say the ratio wise, one dry run and then like ten to fifteen live run. Okay. But walk through. Uh, probably two to three times. Whenever I make mistake, I usually do walk through run, and yeah. often dry fire together. And that's the same. So you're saying that hasn't changed? It's been the same as it was before. Is that correct? Pretty much the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whoa. It's my GoPro. It should be my show and tell. My new GoPro. I see that. Would you like the review of it, Joel? Yeah, tell me. It's like the older GoPros, but it's newer and more expensive. And the software, <laughs> the mobile app is still. Oh, no that bueno. still sucks nuts. Don't worry. It's no. I, I got well, it costs more, like, so it has to be better. I'm like yeah. Ben, I'm having I'm having problems with this app. Is this just me and Ben's? Like, no, it's terrible. I'm like, oh, okay, perfect. No, it's, it We're sucks. Sitting. Literal monkey nuts. It's not good. No, Sorry. It's not. So it's the way life works. All right. Well, who who now? Did I'll you go. get a topic, Ben? I kind of did. Oh, yeah, you did. Never mind. Can we do a question? I got a fun question for you guys. Well, I still have a topic. Yeah, Andreas has a topic. Oh, yeah, Andreas. That's what I was just saying. Someone. So, was out practicing with one of my buddies this weekend, and I think if you're not happy with how fast you're shooting, that the answer is usually to try shooting a cadence and just see what happens. That we, In particular, we were shooting MXAD, and we were going from the close target to the far target. And we we're having some hiccups with uh, getting on the far target. And are we looking at the sights? Are we looking at the, at the targets? Are we, uh, and based on the review, you can probably guess who I was practicing with, Ben. Um, <laughs> so we're trying to figure out how do we, like, how do we cut these transitions from the front target to the back target mm -hmm. down? And kind of the approach we picked was like, well, just the speed that you're shooting at the front target, just keep shooting at that and then just get the gun it. over, just keep doing it mm -hmm. and get the gun over to the back target and just like fucking get it there in time. And like you will, your eyes will figure out how to make it happen. And it, it worked out surprisingly well. We were getting, I mean, we were running like teen splits on the front target and Eventually, we were settling like we were in the high twenties, low thirties, getting to the back target. But uh, that was a big that was a big improvement from some of the early runs where we were requiring too much visual feedback. I think by doing the uh, or too much visual confirmation, I think that the uh, the cadence and just adjusting your cadence can really teach you like how much do you really need to see. There's like, what do you com what are you comfortable dropping the hammer on and what do you need to see? Mm -hmm. And I think by shooting the cadences, you can learn more. What do you really need to see in order to make the hit? And that that's what you need to become comfortable dropping the hammer on. So you're saying you picked out the cadence it has to be, and then you just made the transition in that time, correct? Yeah, I, I couldn't pull it off in the teens. Like that just wasn't working out very well. Like I was dragging shots on the side and on the targets and whatnot. But when I still shot at a cadence that was faster than I was comfortable with, I started punching two alpha or alpha Charlie in the back target. And it was like, okay, maybe like I can get away with a lot less than I thought that I needed on that last target. So I like it. And that's, I've done that. Like when I've been teaching and like we're doing Blake drills or whatnot, where I just kind of, people are taking way too long to drop the hammer on the, like they're running like 20 splits and 50 transitions. I'm like, no, 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 no. You just need to shoot all 20 splits. And mm -hmm. you just, if you shoot it in the dirt, I don't care. Like you just need to do this. All right. So I like the strategy, the, the caveat that I give people. So here's the rule for me. Say, like, we'll give you a cadence. That's a training tool only. Don't do it in a fucking match. Cause yeah. that's stupid. And then the other mm -hmm. thing is your objective when shooting the cadence is not so much to produce the result, but to understand what's happening. You know what I mean? Yeah, like why? Well, if you are missing, why are you missing? Yeah, so for ex in, the, in the example you're giving, where if you're forcing a guy to attack the back target on MXAD really aggressively, for those who don't know, it's 
there's two targets. They're they're basic. There's basically no s- transitional like space between them. They're just separated in depth. So you got one close one and one one longer one. But there's there's you don't have to swing the gun at all to get from one to the other. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's it's a very it's it's a very short swing. But anyway. Uh, if you're going from the close target to the back target and you're forcing a guy to do that more aggressively by using a cadence, uh, he should be able to tell you like, oh, I, I'm pushing the gun past the target and I'm shooting the rounds past the target or I'm not getting the gun back there in time. I'm just pulling the trigger and I'm like dragging the hits onto the target or something like that. If they can specifically understand what's actually happening, they're going to learn a lot. Uh, if they, if they're just making the time and trying to get the result, they're not going to learn that much. So that'd be the caveat that I put in there. Yeah. I like that a lot. I've actually been doing that with accelerator. Well, Ben came down and trained with me a bit and Ben hurt my feelings, how fast he was shooting accelerator. And, uh, I actually made a video for training group, I guess the plug training group, uh, about looking for trends. But while I was doing that, I was basically just shooting accelerator and all of them. I basically shot the targets all at the same speed and I just made the transitions in between, and I just really didn't care that the target was at 25 yards. And I actually learned quite a bit doing that, like like what you guys are saying, because it was like, hey, I'm actually hitting the target. Maybe I'm not getting the maybe I'm not getting the exact results I want. Maybe my eyes are getting sucked on the front side on the 15 yard, you know, target, and maybe I need to be, you know, looking with my eyes first or not snapping the gun or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, I, I like that a lot, where you just like you force it, you kind of just force the time, and then you figure out what's going on. But like what Ben's saying, knowing what's really picking it apart to see what's going on, where the problem lies, what's actually wrong. Uh, I think you learn a lot because I, I want to be able to shoot the accelerator where I shoot all the targets like I shoot the seven yard target. That would be boss. So, yeah, yeah. I watched uh, the video last night, and then the the one thing impressed me was throughout the drill, basically. Uh, cadence-wise, it, it sounded like very similar from the first run and the last run, but what changed was the process uh, of how you center those groups into the alpha zone. That was, I really enjoyed watching it. Good. Awesome. Man, look at you guys all friendly and stuff. <laughs> well, should we take a question? I think it's a pretty fun one. Of course. This may have been discussed before, but I don't recall hearing it on your show. I know several of you are pretty big into video games when not busy with shooting. Is there a video game you or the other shooters who are gamers feel relates best to USPSA shooting skills? Mm. I'll let Kim answer this. There's a lot of different answers. I I got to pass on this one. To answer it differently. No, you come on now. You you know about games. Yeah, right. You played video games with us. You know what's up. I, I well, play but, Call of Duty Modern Warfare. You can select all the optics you want, all the handguns and all the rifles you want. But if you play World War II game, you don't see the red dot. So maybe if you're an iron sight shooter, you, you can <laughs> play old games. But if you shoot carry ops or open play Call of Duty Modern Warfare. Yeah. I like it. Uh, ben, why don't you go next? I think uh, I think the action games are not that interesting. Uh, how about this? I know that when I'm doing classes, I will draw a lot of parallels. Joel, you've heard me do this many uh-huh. times, haven't you? I like the holding the right button on your mouse uh, parallel a lot that you use. But right. yes, so I've heard you I'll use that. parallels between like, hey, when you're when you're transitioning the gun, it should be like you know, using a mouse. It should it should feel like that and look like that and all that stuff. Um, you know, because that's, uh, that's like proper technique is not like throwing the mouse around hard. Or I, I'll like use a parallel to Call of Duty. If the, guy's, if, if the guy appears to be of the, the right age and demographic that he would benefit from a Call of Duty uh, analog where it's, uh, so how about this? When you're staring at your site while you're transitioning, that's like holding down the aim bumper the whole time when you're playing Call of Duty. Is that, is that an example that makes sense to you, Mr. Absolutely Kim? Absolutely does. Yep. All right. So I, I like parallels like that are good. But really, uh, the games that I think would be good for USPSA, it's not so much technical skill, but strategy games I think would be good to learn game theory. You know what I mean? To understand scoring 
and uh, like how to play out the game with a strategy that's going to win you the game in the end. That's an important thing for that's, USPSA. That's what risk, I was going to say. Risk reward. Yes. Like, like actually I understanding of, that stuff is important. I was thinking about our learning curve with police story, Ben. It's actually yeah. the one I was going to pick. Well, you, you're just saying that because you like the game. I do like the game, but I like what the game it's it's what you're talking about, where we didn't even know how to play the game right at first. And then we we're doing different concepts. It's constant problem solving. It's never the same thing. And you're also, I suppose, hand eye coordination you know, looking with your eyes first, I suppose all that stuff. Uh, uh, but yes, it makes you think about it, exercises your brain a bit. And uh, I like that it engages me. It's not mindless, I suppose. That's a fair way of saying it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I suppose so. Yeah, but uh, I, I wouldn't recommend a specific game for USPSA. I think like the VR stuff or, I mean, I've played a USPSA game in VR. Not that helpful for USPSA, quite frankly. It's fun, it's cool, but I mean... No, it is not. It is not directly beneficial. Anybody have anything to add to that one? Oh, the screen shooting. There may be a little bit more beneficial. De definitely more beneficial. Oh, than light gun games. Computer game. Uh, you know, the the screen projector thing. You actually shoot a pistol that projects laser out of it. Yeah, so that's like yeah. the old school light gun stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, that's cool. Hey, oh, this reminds me. Guys, I've ordered another video game cabinet for my video game room. You told me. I'm excited. I told you. I, I did not that. tell Mr. Kim, and I did not tell Mr. Andreas. Would you guys like to know what I've ordered for you to play yes. next time you join me? Uh, i got a four-player NBA Jam cabinet coming. Ooh. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a classic, a I classic used to be game. Many quarters were consumed on that game, sir. Well, you can play to your heart's content in the very near future, my man. Now you're you know? talking my language. Yeah, I am. All right, well, right. listeners, what? Oh, yeah. All right, listeners, that's all we have for you. Uh, it's the end of the show. If you have any questions or comments, go to bensaker.com. Send me your questions. We would, well, we'd love to hear them. You know, we, we always enjoy that stuff. How do I how do I kill this fucking? You and that recording? mouse sliding around everywhere. The audio <laughs> people.